Welcome to our live webcast, 23-hour TKA and 10 opioid pills or less by Dr. Andrew Wickline. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob, and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a Q&A slash polling window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you'll type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box, type your text, and when finished, click the Ask button. All of the questions you submit are only seen by today's presenters, and your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our moderator, Krista Fortenberry, and Dr. Andrew Wickline of Genesee Orthopedics in New Hartford, New York. This time I'll turn the presentation over to Krista to open the presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. We're excited to hear tonight from orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Andrew Wickline of Guinness Orthopedics and Plastic Surgery Associates of New Hartford, New York. Dr. Wickline is a graduate of Albany Medical College in Albany, New York, and completed his orthopedic residency at Albany Medical Center, also in Albany, New York. Dr. Wickline then completed his adult reconstruction fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. He is board certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and his clinical practice specializes in anterior hip replacement, total knee replacement, therapy-free total knee replacement, and outpatient hip and knee replacement. Today, Dr. Wickline will review his 23-hour total knee arthroplasty in 10 opioid pills or less through 90 days as published in the Journal of Orthopedic Experience and Innovation. Thank you all for your time, engagement, and participation. And please help me in wel welcoming Dr. Andrew Wickline. Dr. Wickline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Krista. And thank you for all of the attendees. You know, it's uh, coronavirus, uh, doing these kind of conferences, it's a little difficulty, it was a little difficult for me to know if if I'm putting you to sleep or not. So please feel free to uh, send questions into Krista. She'll try to bunch them together. And I'd like to try to answer some of those um, as we go. If she thinks we're going to answer them with later content, then she may skip over some. So don't feel that she's singling you out. Um, but uh, I do like to have some participation you know, as we go through it because it's so challenging just to stare at a screen and, and talk uh, for the next uh, uh, 40 to 60 minutes. So let's get started. So again, uh, you know, what I'm really talking about is how do you get your total knee patients to, to uh, get through that painful surgery, which uh, I know all of you feel that uh, everyone can agree with me that the first couple of weeks pretty miserable. And how do you get them through 10 pills or less? And that includes up to 90 days. And I'm gonna show you, and this is the data that uh, we published. As a disclaimer, uh, again, uh, I'm my own surgeon, so uh, these, are, these are my thoughts, my thought processes, so you need to use the accompanying package information uh, should you uh, use any of the Avanos product. Uh, I have received uh, stipends in the past for speaking on behalf of Avanos and Higher Health as well as Swift Path, uh, as well as Basira uh, in the past. Again, she went over my uh, uh, you know, history. I've been in the same practice for the last 18 years. I think one thing that's a little different than how we were able to get to the success rate is every quarter I try to operate with someone new. Uh, so I'm always looking for new sites. Anyone who's doing it you know, better than me or might have a better a way to approach patients, I'm, I'm interested in coming out and visiting. And so what I've done over the last uh, 18 years is kind of amalgamated all of those different uh, thought processes into the current protocol. So my current practice, I do about 700 to 800 total joints a year, uh, puts my practice in the top five in the entire state of New York for volume. I do a 99% anterior hip, uh, computer navigation for 16 straight years. Um, I've done four years of therapy-free joint replacement and opioid sparing. I've stopped using the tourniquet two years ago. And currently my average length of stay for all hips and knees, all age groups uh, is less than one day. When we look at our complication rates, uh, both at the hospital, my hospital is 1.6%, that's the lowest in New York State uh, in the most recent uh, CMS data. 
and you benchmark that against the uh, um, data here, you can see that you know, we're doing fairly well with our personal rate uh, at 1.2%. So the goals of this presentation, how do you uh, consistently get down to that 10 number? Um, how do you use little uh, or no post-discharge therapy, uh, which of course allows you to achieve an ultra low 90 day spend. Uh, so if you're in the BPCIA uh, group, this can help you uh, with your uh, tally at the end of the quarter. How do you get to that lower length of stay uh, and the complication rates? And then I think ideally, if, the, if you're new to this, you need to go and meet with your commercial payers and tell them, hey, listen, I'm, I'm interested in trying to do what other practices in other parts of the country are doing, and let's create a, a bundle program. And you want to do this ahead of time. I have learned to my chagrin that I should have done this four years ago. Uh, maybe I would have better reimbursement. So we all know the opioid epidemic uh, is out there. It's somewhat overshadowed by coronavirus, but if you look at your Google feed, you'll find uh, that there's a number of articles talking about how it's actually worse now because of coronavirus. I think this, uh, this one right here, uh, number two down, uh, is very helpful when you go to speak to your commercial payers. Opioid abusers cost employers nearly twice as much uh, in average annual medical expenses than non-abusers. So you want to uh, limit uh, that potential. We know that dependency can begin even with a 24 hour prescription. Uh, so that uh, poses a 6% uh, long-term uh, use risk uh, in opioid naive patients. 10 days of opioids leads up, can get up to 20%. The number that I see in the literature is about 13 to 14% of all opioid naive total knee arthroplasties done in the United States become chronic users. So uh, I'm a member of AUKUS. I, I went in 2014. I said, no way was outpatient total knee ever going to happen. It was too painful. But uh, when I came back a year later, it was apparent to me that I needed to reevaluate that conclusion. And uh, at that time, there was a company out uh, called Swift Path that uh, had a, a somewhat ready to go uh, program. So I, I uh, got myself involved with them. And uh, set some goals and the goals were to reduce opioids and try to get to outpatients and at that time I felt that therapy was causing more trouble than it was worth. I'd already given some data at the World Arthroplasty Conference based on that uh, and uh, so I wanted to try to remove that if possible. At the same time maintain or improve the complication rate. So up until the, my practice uh, rewrite or rethink, I had uh, about eight years of anterior hip. So my length of stay was pretty good, 1.5 days. My total knee was a little better than the average at that time, which was 3.2. Mine was down at 2.2, but I was still giving 100 Norco tablets. My 90-day episode of care for total knee was 22,000. Um, I was using the pain cocktail that most people are using. I was using spinals with a single shot uh, anterior canal block all the multimodal meds, uh, sending patients to therapy, and uh, I had no real emphasis on outpatient surgery. And you can see that's where a lot of other practices were just published uh, out of uh, New York uh, Langone. So it's a high volume academic center, uh, all bundle patients from 2015 to 2019. You can see that their total knee cost was a little more, maybe uh, $3,000 more. The readmission rate was significant at 5.3%. Length of stay, again, a little higher. And similar ASA uh, uh, medical comorbidity risk as in my study. And their home discharge rate was 78%. So I asked myself, why are total knees still painful? I was using direct anterior approach and I was seeing approximately 40% of patients narcotic free from discharge from PACU, which we actually just published this month. Uh, it's about 38% of all my total hips are completely opioid free. And so again, my gestalt was that uh, we were doing something different uh, with direct anterior and none of the different muscle sparing approaches made, made that same kind of difference when I was doing knee replacements. I was only seeing less than 5% narcotic free uh, and that was despite the uh, liposomal bupivacaine trials. I did two separate trials, 100 patients each. I saw no difference in pain scores and no difference in narcotic uh, opioid pills. Uh, again, the, the navigation, uh, minimally invasive approaches, no help. I did find that the intraarticular catheter helped, but uh, very concerned about the infection risk. So I've had three knee scopes and I, I started I thought, thinking to myself, what is it that causes pain? I believe it's the, the tight capsule closure that, that leads to that high swelling, it's localized, and it's almost like a, 
uh, uh, compartment syndrome. My, my first surgery I behaved, it was not painful at all after knee arthroscopy. My second surgery, I went and uh, got a haircut. I had hair then. I went to um, Tractor Supply, went to a party. The next day, I had 100 cc's of blood on my knee and I could not walk. It was unbelievably painful until I got the fluid out. And so I kind of had this own, my own feeling that the key uh, to, to reducing pain was to stop uh, getting these knees big and swollen and painful. So, um, and I think we've all seen this. We know that at that 36 hour window, that's where patients are painful. And so you need to find a way to improve that. I also surmised again that the, doing too much after surgery, uh, which you know, currently the, the protocol is to go to therapy. It's a 60 to 90 minute session. I know if I work out for 60 to 90 minutes, I'm gonna be very sore for the next two days and that's without a new total knee and not being 78 years old. So I thought to myself that if we could reduce that uh, painful aggressive therapy and just work on range of motion, uh, that we would potentially lead to less complications, which we showed uh, in 2016 as proof of concept. So uh, I also believe that this, this idea of uh, prehabilitation may or may not be correct. I think that there's some reasonable data out there that shows that uh, increased uh, activity on an arthritic knee shows increased numbers of nociceptors. Uh, and I believe that postoperatively those uh, may become uh, uh, intensified, which may lead to, to higher pain scores. And then I was worried about tourniquet. So I, my hypothesis was that if I could uh, find a way to get patients over that 36 hour window that we all know occurs, uh, and that's why everyone's there over two days because they have to get over that 36 to 48 hour swelling window. If I can get them home with a long acting block and stop the conventional therapy and replace it with a different plan that controls swelling better and reduce the number of people giving bad advice that's not consistent with my plan, that I would see less narcotic use, have quicker recovery, have less complications, happier patients and therefore happier staff and uh, possibly gain more surgical volume. So how do we implement this? Uh, again, I think that what's old is new. Um, look at Marshall Steele's uh, stuff from the late 90s, this whole idea of a boot camp or joint camp and having a coach involved and everyone understanding uh, what's involved. This makes a big difference. You wanna create an entire episode of care uh, within a, a book, uh, which is what I did. It took me six months, nights and weekends. And, uh, and then you, you train all of your staff to say the same thing. Uh, I also do all the optimization myself. I cannot rely on my primary care provider to know that albumin of 3.2 is a problem or to, to clear a patient with a hemoglobin A1C of nine. I, see, I used to see that routinely and I just, I, I, I order all the labs six weeks ahead of surgery so that I can review them myself before the patient gets booked so that I know that the patient has been optimized. And then they, I create a, a specific post-op plan for every patient based on their own personal comorbidities. We try to stay away from narcotics uh, in the hospital. Uh, there's some concern about central uh, sensitization to narcotic. And, and then again, I use the adductor canal block with a catheter pre-op. Uh, and then we start the on cue ball in the PACU. So again, I created a simple at-home therapy-free plan. It's in the paper if you want to look at that. I do my best not to send the uh, home therapist or a home health aide into the uh, home and no outpatient PT uh, because again, uh, well-intentioned but uh, inappropriate advice. Um, every post-op visit mirrors exactly what's in my book. And you know, I think the biggest key is, is really from the neck up, you wanna control their anxiety. Uh, early intervention to get range of motion is vital. I think if a patient uh, is falling off the curve at that 10 to 14 day point, you give them the riot act that they need to work harder on your home exercises or else they will need to go to therapy uh, and spend money. And all of a sudden, most of those patients actually will do what they need to get done. So after I spent uh, November through May kind of rewriting my whole thought process, we implemented the program. So here's the first uh, six, seven months here. 22% uh, were same day discharge. I had you know, less than 1% prior to this. 74% uh, went home within 23 hours. My target was 90%, so I'm only a B minus student here. I was able to significantly reduce my opioid pills for most patients. My recidivism rate uh, in that uh, period was uh, unchanged at the 1.01%. Uh, we were seeing uh, an average of 110 degrees at three weeks. 
75% uh, were using no therapy, but I'm still having a fair amount of inpatient rehab. It takes a while to kind of recondition the people in your town and, and, uh, and your patients that this is a, a good thing. My length of stay got down significantly. It went from 2.2 to 1.1. Interestingly, I saw a 23% increase in volume with 98% satisfaction scores. Uh, I was not, I, I'd hoped I would see some more volume with this, but I was surprised at how much patients really want to be outpatient and don't really want to spend that money and don't want to inconvenience their daughter uh, with therapy and, and don't want to use opioids. So then we looked at the next uh, eight months. So we did 503 cases, uh, 289 total knees, 210 total hips, a couple of partials, average length of stay improving yet again. I got another third of a day off for total hips and another 0.2 off for total knees. We now are seeing more home discharge of the total knees. And I was now at that, that almost that 90% home with 23 hours. Um, and at that time we were seeing 90% no therapy other than in the hospital. Recidivism rate still uh, essentially unchanged. So I thought that perhaps 30% of the total knees were using no narcotics and less than 40% and about 40% were using less than 10 pills, but I really wanted to document that. Uh, and then again, here's, this is from the CMS. This is from my hospital, St. Louis Hospital in uh, Utica, New York. You can see we were, we were coming along pretty well, you know, but as we trend lower, and then this is where we, we kick into this outpatient uh, protocol, you can see that the numbers drop significantly over these next two years. So not only uh, is this uh, uh, important from a bundle perspective, uh, but it's, it's a patient uh, complications that rates have gone down here. So in 2018, uh, I asked the Halyard Health, which is now Avanos, to uh, help fund a observational study to determine my hospital and post-op opioid consumption because I believe it to be the lowest in the nation. My goals were to develop a pathway which led to a narcotic-free total need for 90% of patients, so I still haven't beat that yet. And I'd like to get 99% of patients home within 23 hours, so I'm still working hard on that. But again, this is an all-comer, non-selected uh, cohort. This is my entire year of patients. And I wanted to see a range of motion of 121, uh, 120 degrees by 21 days. So uh, the details of the study uh, uh, can be seen here. So I suspect your Ivanos rep can get to this if, uh, if you don't have a chance to write this down. But we saw we had 386 consecutive prospective total knee patients. These were non-selected. So every single patient that came to my office uh, that had a knee replacement uh, zero narcotics. This includes any narcotic in the hospital from pack you on. So it was only actually 18.9% of zero narcotics. But when you uh, subtract out those hospital doses, many patients receive one to two doses in the hospital. So the number is about, uh, is actually over 30% of no narcotics after discharge. But when you add hospital narcotics, here are the numbers. So you're able to get to 86% uh, of uh, patients using 10 pills or less. Uh, through 90 days, so no refills. This is all verified through New York State iStop database. So there's, there's no way for me to fudge the data. It's if, whether it's me or anyone else providing the narcotics uh, legally, uh, it's there. Uh, so unless they're getting it from uh, someone else, uh, we were able to get down to this very low number. Uh, interestingly, over 55% of those uh, narcotic pills actually were tramadol. So I'm using more and more tramadol and less oxycodone. Uh, we were able to get up to 64% same day and 91% within 23 hours. And through 90 days, 85% uh, used no therapy. And there was a 1.2%, a 90 day complication rate. So here's the data from uh, Scripps uh, Clinic. This is now published in 2019 at JAOS. They need 78 oxycodone, 10 milligrams. I, I don't ever use that dose. Uh, uh, I, that would be an equivalent of 156 pills for me. Um, and this was just the opioid naive, naive patients. Uh, and um, they, uh, so they excluded any patient who had had opioids previously, I think in the three months previous, and rehab patients were also excluded. Again, my study showed uh, it was all comers, including those patients using opioids preoperatively and rehab patients. Here's a little better uh, results out of uh, Dave Delory's group, uh, they are showing that 55% are off from narcotics at week four. We were at 91% by three weeks. Um, so again, uh, it's doable. 
Rothman's group, rehab discharge, and pre-op opioid use are, are significant risk factors for opioid use at six months. And there's multiple studies showing that now. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, just published uh, this month out of, uh, I believe this is out of Maryland. Uh, it's the Anderson Clinic. Uh, narcotic consumption in opioid naive patients. So selected patients undergoing uh, uh, unicompartmental total needs. So 60 pills of any one type of narcotic were needed for 90% of the uh, UKAs and 75% of the TKAs. Uh, so uh, again, I think this data speaks for itself. So what are the factors critical to success? Number one, you gotta engage your patient in the process. You really need to have them uh, uh, you know, uh, be part of the plan. Um, coming in and say, I'm gonna sign you up for surgery and you're gonna get a book and I'll see you at the day of surgery and then you'll see my PA. You really have to, to do a little better job of um, getting them involved and getting them to read that book and understanding what's going to happen. You need to reduce the anxiety. The anxiety, I think, is why many patients uh, have trouble. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, in some, in some ways, maybe almost 40% of it is the education and the, the anxiety. You educate, you have less anxiety. Less anxiety means less narcotic use. You've got to find a way to control the pain and swelling while maintaining that range of motion. If your patients get amazing range of motion within two to three weeks, their pain rapidly gets better. They're getting out of the house easier. They're happier. They're not going to use narcotics. I do think you should rethink this conventional post-op therapy model. Uh, none of you do an open reduction in terminal fixation of a tibial plateau fracture and then have that patient do sit to stand exercises three weeks after, total, after that operation. You know, there's, those patients are non-weight bearing for eight to 12 weeks. So why are we doing that to total knees? We don't do that to ankle fractures or anything else. So uh, rethink that, at least uh, put it in the back of your brain because I do think this makes a big difference in uh, pain control. And you need to control who's giving input to your patients. It's your protocol uh, that you and your team are, are espousing. You need to make sure that you, you keep that within your team. So again, I think you need to have this, this, this education book. I wrote it myself. Every single word uh, is something that I've reviewed personally. And I review it every quarter to add uh, whatever the latest and greatest I think is. Uh, the patient has to go through that book and I want them to read it. The therapist uh, that I, uh, I have every patient see a therapist preoperatively and that therapist has to be on board with me that they uh, can explain the simple exercises I want them to do and explain what's going to happen after surgery. Um, and then when the patient meets with me at that point prior to surgery, we make a specific plan. So if they've got kidney dysfunction, they're not getting uh, NSAIDs. They're gonna get some low dose prednisone. If they've got kidney dysfunction, they may not get uh, gabapentin 300, they may get 100 at nighttime. Um, if they've got a history of uh, uh, GI bleed, maybe I'm not using baby aspirin for that patient. So you have to make a plan specific to that patient, but optimize those non-narcotic medications. Uh, and then you write that down on the inside cover of your book and everyone knows what the plan is. Patients agreed to it, patients, uh, coaches agreed to it, and then when they show up at the hospital, the nurse looks at the inside cover and says, oh, you're going to have a right total knee. And these are the medications you're going to use after surgery. Same thing is said in the second stage recovery when they're heading home. So some of the keys, I think, uh, again, you need to have, uh, ideally, you want to be less than an hour operative time. Uh, you need to understand what that best recovery room practice is. I found uh, when I was doing this study that the, my recovery room nurses were using a lot of narcotic initially in the recovery room um, where I thought Toradol could maybe be a better bridge. And it, that has made a big difference. Again, I worry about that central sensitization. Uh, I have an emergency phone hotline that Dr. Lowry Barnes uh, presented in 2014 or 15 that he, he gives out his number to all the patients. I'm a little hesitant to do that. So I, I have a separate phone that either myself or my PA carries that uh, the patient can get a hold of me or my PA personally, someone who's on the total joint team who can, again, give the best advice rather than my hand uh, surgeon partner that says, you better go to the ER, I don't know what to do. I do think you should have a data collection plan in place so that you can uh, identify trends. Again, create your best physical therapy practice on what your belief system is. And uh, you do need consistent follow-up. I don't personally use a nurse navigator, but I think if you were doing 
uh, double my practice or even maybe a thousand patients a year, you're going to need someone that is every day and knows where every patient is. So again, uh, uh, we've got this uh, steps, make a book, as crazy as it sounds, uh, the, the book that the hospital you know, gives to your patients that's also good for uh, Joe Smith down the street and, and Marianne uh, up the street, that information that that patient gets is useless to the patient because it has nothing to do with your specific protocol. So you need your protocol written out in a very clear, uh, non-doctor uh, speak um, uh, pathway. And again, you need to review it because you make changes uh, in your process. You want to put the entire episode of care. So I have uh, on, on page one, it says, uh, I think you think you're ready for knee replacement. Have you had injections? Have you tried therapy? Have you tried weight reduction? I have uh, nutrition uh, for preoperatively. I have how to get your house ready. I have a week before, day before, night uh, before, uh, morning of, night of surgery, and the next 14 days, every single day spelled out in my book. And then I have messages and text messages uh, that are inside the book for the next six weeks. Uh, so you really want to have that entire episode of care in the book. And that becomes the patient's personal pathway to success. Uh, there, I think there are several companies that do this now. Uh, and you make the patient carry that book to every appointment so they know that it's important and they become engaged in the process. So here's an example of one of my, my very first book. You can see the patients have, have, have got each, it's only, this, my very first book was 25 pages. And they have... Uh, uh, every section laid out uh, so that they can find it for a quick reference. Here's a patient that said, Dr. Wicklin, you need more than 14 days worth of uh, um, protocol postoperatively. And so since you didn't have it, I wrote my own out. So these are two patients who are they're two different patients. They're both totally engaged in their outcomes. And that's what you want to have a happy, successful patient. So in your pre-op checklist, you know, this is again, six weeks before the actual surgery. I try to get the who's and coos and the promise scores. I have the patients attend the class. Now we don't do the class. Uh, I, I recorded the class uh, online so my patients can hear me give the class. And uh, that takes away a COVID-19 potential exposure risk. Uh, again, they all see a therapist that's on board with my program. This is key. Getting this blood work done ahead of time, I think, is very important so that you can uh, optimize these patients. I uh, tell my patients I want a BMI less than 40. I have a BMI poster in the room so that by the time the patient gets in the room and they've seen that poster, they, it says unsafe for elective surgery over 40. It's not a, it's not a difficult conversation. Now, uh, you can see in my study that I've done, I did a fair number of patients over 40, but those patients were at 47, 48, and they got down to 42, 41. They made an honest effort to get their weight down. They were involved in their care. And so we got them fixed. Education class uh, either needs, should be taught by your personal office staff. Again, now I'm teaching it because of coronavirus. Uh, but uh, uh, prior to that, I had my medical assistant teach the class. Uh, again, it's an opportunity for the patient to, uh, to learn and meet another person in your staff that they can connect with. Uh, and my, my medical assistants assist me in surgery. They all um, rotate, so again, they know the different things we're thinking about and talking about so they're able to answer questions and you want to keep the class size down if you're going to go back to that uh, uh, large group format. So Dr. Wickline, just a question yes. for you. So your pre-op, um, your anesthesia, what are they using, um, what drugs concentration and volume are they using for ACB preoperatively? So they're using the uh, ropivacaine it's 15 cc's, uh, I don't have it in front of me, I believe it's the 0.25%. Um, and then they overfill the ball, we're gonna get to that, they overfill the ball to uh, 550 cc's down in the pharmacy for me. Uh, so that, it's a 400 uh, uh, milliliter ball, and we'll talk about that later. I've got it spelled out specifically, it's just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say it wrong and then have my numbers being correct. <laughs> so, it, with the education and the teaching and, and the classes, what if you have a patient that doesn't have a coach that's available? Um, how, how do you, what do you recommend for, for those patients? So it does occasionally happen. And in, in early, it's interesting. Early on, a lot of the patients said, I can't find anyone. And I don't really hear that anymore four years into it. 
So one of two things are happening. If the, the, that patient is uh, going somewhere else, um, or that patient, which most, most frequently happens, that patient asks a neighbor, a good friend. Uh, a lot of my patients are veterans, so I, and I tell them, well, why don't you go down to the VFW? You've got a guys that you hang out with all the time. You know, it's kind of like boot camp. They'd be happy to help you, I'm certain. And interestingly, uh, a lot of those guys, uh, that's what they do. They follow through with that. And uh, uh, they kind of rekindle old uh, friendships that way. So I've, I've been pretty successful with that. But you are right. There are one or two. You can see my study. There are a couple patients who did go to rehab. There are a couple patients that either can't be discharged safely or, uh, again, they really have no help. They've got three flights of stairs and they're a fall risk. Thanks. So again, uh, what happens in that pre-op therapy visit? Again, I do encourage this. This is important, I think, um, but it, not the prehabilitation, but the actual education. That's why I want this pre-op therapy visit. So I want patients to understand how they're going to use a walker and a cane before surgery. I want them to go over stair climbing and, and handrails because that's an opportunity in that six weeks uh, prior to surgery for them to make those simple changes in their house at least in my area, it takes a good three or four weeks to get a handyman to come into the house to do so, some of those things. You wanna really talk about orthostatic hypotension uh, and get it out there that the patients tend to have uh, increased risk for fall. In my experience, the first 48 hours, they tend to get lightheaded when they stand up. Um, that's with or without a pain ball. Uh, so, and I see that with the hips, same thing. So uh, you really wanna go over that. We talked about this briefly before. I can't count on my patients being medically optimized. So patients are cleared based on the, the old Goldman criteria for a cardiac. None of the other factors that the other total joint surgeons know that are risk factors, but those primary care providers, they don't go to total joint meetings. They have no idea that that makes a big difference or not. So I do think you need to um, take ownership of this if you wanna see uh, the change in the outcomes. I think number three is important, uh, the urinary outflow problems. It's still a challenge in my practice. Uh, I know that recent studies have been saying that the spinal may be a little better than general. I can tell you that bupivacaine spinal uh, markedly increases your risk of uh, overnight stay and needing uh, a Foley catheterization in your male patients. And there's now two studies uh, showing that the mupivacaine is better. Some of my anesthesiologists use the chlorprocaine and the lidocaine. Lidocaine's a off-label use because of the black box warning, but that's where you can really see a uh, decrease in that risk for uh, urinary outflow uh, obstruction. I'm, uh, I'm pretty hard on the smoking cessation. I tell patients I'm going to test them uh, the day of surgery, uh, and if they test positive, I will not, uh, I will cancel surgery and I will not rebook them. They're not welcome back to the office. So uh, I don't want a cancellation the day of surgery because of that. Um, so that's one really kind of hard and fast rule that I have. Uh, I do do a DVTPE history preoperatively. I think that's important to look and see who patients are at genetic uh, risk for that. Surprisingly, you'd be surprised at how many patients have a family member that had, uh, or two family members who are positive, but they'd never been tested. And then sleep apnea is important. If they're gonna go home the same night, they need to have a machine or they should stay overnight in the hospital and then vitamin D supplementation. So uh, at this point, the patient has seen my PA, they decided they wanted to have surgery, they've seen the physical therapist, they've done my education class, now they're seeing me. This is the fourth time prior to surgery that they're going to be educated and I'm going to review the exercises, I'm going to review what's in the book and make sure that they know what's going to happen. So I personally review all the lab data, make sure that everything has been uh, addressed uh, and then I document where the patient's risk factors are. Uh, and I make sure the patient's aware of that so that we're both on the same page. Hey, you have a little greater risk. You've got diabetes. Uh, your albumin improved some, but it's still not over 4.0. Uh, so you've got a, you know, you're, you've got neutral risk there, but you don't have a predictive risk there, or protective rather. Um, and we make a plan on the, what medications we're going to use. I don't use the validated tools for discharge. I think that's helpful when you're first trying to send patients home if you're worried. But it, it turns out if you really optimize each patient the same way, as you can see from my recidivism, it, it, doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, I personally tell patients I expect you to be the same day or, or I may need to keep you overnight. You'll be surprised that your 78 year old patients who say, well, geez doc, I'm, I'm not real happy about that. I really wanna go home the same day. Nobody wants to be uh, a B minus student if you say it that way. 
Uh, and so those patients actually work hard towards going home the same day. Uh, and then I make sure that both the patient and the coach can uh, verify and show me how the exercises are performed. So again, here are the things that are in the study. Uh, DVT prophylaxis, I try to use aspirin for everyone, um, unless they have a GI ulcer history or a gastric bypass. I don't use it, uh, home SCDs. Um, I find that they are expensive. And uh, again, it's just another uh, point where it's challenging for the patient to do all these different steps. And you can see in our data uh, from our DVT uh, data in the study, uh, I think we're doing pretty well from that standpoint. We need a larger uh, study to, to prove that, however. I use Tylenol, I use the, the 3,000 milligrams a day. Uh, I try to use Celebrex or Mobic for most patients daily. I think if you're over 80, that's where a patient, you know, maybe I do that for only seven days. Uh, and if, again, if I have any history of GI bleed, then I won't use that medication. Uh, I will use some low dose prednisone instead for that patient. I try to give tramadol to everyone, but a previous narc user will, uh, a narcotic user, I'll tell them you've got two choices, tramadol milder, oxycodone stronger, uh, you know, side effects with one, less side effects with the other. What do you feel? And I feel them out. Many of those patients will actually say, I want to try the tramadol doc. I'm worried about addiction. So it's all how you present it. Uh, again, you have to have a sleep apnea plan. Uh, I use Miralax uh, post-op until bowel movement once a day. And then every patient gets that list of meds to pick up uh, for, so it's done prior to surgery. One week prior, the patient uh, meets either now virtually over the uh, phone with my uh, hospital or my surgery center. Um, the uh, education book, again, has detailed sheets for one week, day before, and so forth. And then I make sure that the hospital, the patients call the hospital or the surgery center the night before to verify exactly what time they have to arrive. Many of you uh, in practice know that there's a last minute cancellation. And if you can't get a hold of patients and adjust the schedule accordingly, it, it really throws your day into disarray. And so this allows, should allow you to get up to 10 cases done by 3.30 if you've got a really efficient team uh, doing this. The day of surgery, uh, arrived two hours ahead. I use uh, uh, oral vancoma, uh, excuse me, oral transdemic acid. Uh, I typically use ANCEF and uh, uh, weight-based vancomycin and weight-based ANCEF preoperatively. It takes an hour for the uh, vancomycin. Again, if you're kind of somewhat draconian in the beginning, you know, no, no book, no surgery, all of a sudden, again, patients understand that uh, I'm serious about reading that book. And you really want to get the fluids on board. Well-hydrated patients do better. Uh, the study talks about the different preemptive meds that make a difference. Over, I have a separate adductor canal block area. That's where my anesthesiologist placed the block. There is a method where the surgeon can place the catheter. I am not an expert at that, but uh, Avanos can, can reach out to you if you reach, talk to your uh, Avanos rep. Uh, there are several sites doing that. I've got colleagues I've convinced to uh, use this. They couldn't get their anesthesia team to do it, so they're doing it this way in Buffalo. They're doing it this way in Binghamton. Uh, and uh, so I, there's two different ways that you can get that done. Again, uh, stay away from the marcaine with that short acting spinal. Uh, if you're using a tourniquet, you can place that directly over the catheter, but you want to make sure that you use a, a lap pad or one of those blue uh, disposable towels to, to prevent the eye band from sticking to the opposite. And then uh, in my study, uh, we used the intraoperative cocktail was morphine, tordol, marcaine, and I use no morphine for patients over 70 or sensitivity to narcotics. Uh, I've been currently using the clonidine uh, in the hospital and for those patients over 70. Uh, that seems to help some. I trialed the ketamine. Uh, I know Dr. Worthington uh, really feels strongly about it. I really had some trouble with the patients uh, being too um, sleepy, uh, almost uh, in that, that funny ketamine uh, fugue state. So I, I went away from that. Uh, Again, I used to use the close the skin while under the tourniquet. Uh, in this study, uh, there was no tourniquet. I don't use a drain. I use a silver impregnated dresser, no mobilizer, unless it's a very short leg uh, that the patient, the therapist postoperatively sees that there's some weakness and some buckling maybe. That patient may get a mobilizer for 24 hours. That happens maybe once a quarter uh, that we see that. If, the, uh, if your anesthesiologist placed the block too uh, proximal, you're gonna get some quadriceps uh, weakness. So, you really want your, yourself or your anesthesiologist, whoever's placing that catheter, you really want to get the education that Avanos can provide to place it correctly. Um, 
Again, try to stay away from narcotics in the PACU. You'll be surprised at how many PACU nurses just want that patient to be asleep when they go on to the next uh, stage. So uh, after, prior to discharge, every patient has to see a therapist to make sure they can repeat the education and, and do the exercises and do some stairs and ambulate. Uh, I make sure that the nurses are reviewing the on cue uh, ball, how it works. And I use the titratable one. We'll show you that in the pictures coming up. And then you can send them home and a phone call that evening will uh, help you and the patient rest better knowing that everything's okay. Again, it's all about patient messaging. You need to tell the patients that the 30, first 36 hours are generally relatively easy, but you need to expect that pain spike the uh, night after surgery, that you know, the following night and, and through day two, which we all know happens. Uh, that's where you may need to ice and elevate. You may need to turn that pain ball up from a, a six to an eight or a 10. And then when the pain gets better, turn it back down so the ball, the ball lasts longer. Uh, you tell them that days three, four, and five are tough, uh, and then the pain ball comes out, and there's another six-hour window where you might have pain. And, and uh, I always find it very interesting. When you ask your patients at six weeks, what's the, you know, uh, Mrs. Smith, what, what could I have done better? Doc, make me a pain ball that lasts six weeks. So it gives you an idea that, that this makes a big difference for them, and they can see the difference. Uh, my patients do eight minutes per hour of a therapy protocol for the first one to two weeks, uh, and then 40 minutes of ice and elevation, and then 12 minutes uh, they get to do what they want. So again, that's at least seven to 10 days. Just like with an ankle fracture, after that first two weeks, pain is a lot better. So Dr. Wickline. Yes. Going, you mentioned earlier that you did, um, you did two trials with Pacera. Mm -hmm. And can you kind of elaborate a little bit on your results that you saw with using Pacera versus where you are now and, and with the pain ball or with the on cue and with being able to have the patients titrate it themselves? Sure. So the first uh, uh, use of the liposomal pivocaine, we did 100 patients. We looked at the, our... Um, our pain scores a month in you know, the, the preceding uh, six weeks. And then we did another hundred patients using the, the, uh, uh, the product and looked at pain scores and there was no difference. So, you know, I said, you, my hospital said, there's no difference. And we're not going to do this cost anymore. They, they were the ones that actually said, we're willing to spend the money, but you know, show us the difference. And uh, so then I went back to the company and said, I'm not seeing a difference uh, and I'm not going to use it. So about six months later, they said, well, maybe it's because of my technique. I wasn't doing the 300 aliquots in the seven zonal areas. And so I, I watched a bunch of videos on how to do that and, and followed their newest protocol for that. And this time I looked at narcotic use. And this is while patients were still in-house, uh, 2.25 days. And I saw no difference in narcotic dosing uh, prior to or during the new trial. And you're going to see a slide here shortly that shows once I went to the adductor canal ball with the pain, uh, with the adductor canal block with the pain ball, uh, that we significantly saw a significant reduction in opioid uh, doses, a uh, factor of 10. So we were at about 400 per month, and we went down to like 36 to 40 per month. So I think that slide's coming up shortly. Thank you. Hopefully that answers the question, hopefully. And, and to be fair, you know, I, that, I wanted it to work. It's... I didn't have to engage my, my anesthesiologist, but I just couldn't make it work. And there's you know, multiple studies you know, showing that it doesn't work. There's some that suggest that it does, but you know, it either works or it doesn't. It didn't work for me. Uh, so at 12 days, I have my patients evaluated either um, typically with my nurse for a wound check. If there's staples, we get the staples out. If they're not at five to 105 degrees, they get uh, talking, you know, speaking to and uh, you know, say, hey, you're behind, I need you to, to catch up. Uh, and uh, they, they will see us again at three weeks so we can do another measurement. If there's any issues at all, they see the PA. So at 18 to 21 days, so we get about three weeks, uh, we get an x-ray, we check the wounds again, uh, typically about 110 degrees, our average was 109 from the study. Uh, no cane and no narcotics after 10 days uh, for 73%. And you saw that in Dave Delury's study that took four weeks uh, to get uh, to 55% of patients off of narcotics. Um, and at that point, 23% uh, were using no narcotics. Interestingly enough, what happens is patients have trouble sleeping. So that's one of the areas where patients will use narcotics and why we dropped off uh, to 18.9% uh, 
is that the patients after three weeks, there's a percentage of patients using a narcotic to help get to sleep. And at that time, we were at 92% no therapy. Uh, what will happen at the six week visit, there's some patients that kind of fall off, they were doing great, and then they just didn't push anymore, or the patients may be having specific problems such as stairs, and maybe that's the best time to start doing therapies at six weeks. We all know that once you open that knee at three weeks, say someone falls down and splits their knee open uh, at three weeks post-op, that may have happened to many of the surgeons on the, on the call, that tissue was terrible. It's like sewing jello. So why are we doing sit to stand exercises at three weeks? We know how bad that tissue is and how, how likely a rupture can occur. So again, sleep remains to be a problem. Uh, so again, this is where patients were are using the opioids after three weeks. So when a lot of those patients had never used any opioid and then they used one or two pills after three weeks to try to help sleep. Um, I've been doing some cryoablation for this. If anyone has a, uh, uh, a different answer for sleep, I would love to hear it. So here's the block details. Uh, so it's a single shot of 15 to 20%, 0.5% ripivacaine. Uh, and then it's the uh, dermabond uh, around the catheter. We use, again, that larger ball, the 40 ml ball, uh, and you titrate that starting in recovery room at six. Uh, I use the variable rate between four and uh, 14. Uh, six seems to be the right number, uh, at least in my practice. Uh, some simple pictures that uh, we can kind of pass through here. So this is what it looks like when they're done before you go into surgery. Here's that surgery. So you got to make sure your cat, your anesthesiologist places the catheter up so it's not down into your wound. And you can see I've got some, uh, 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 in this case, I've got some webral underneath. Uh, and then the, the sticky U-drape will kind of fit right over this, no problem. But sometimes in a short leg, your opsite is still sticking down here. So you want to cover that with a sterile um, lap pad or something like that. So here's leaving the uh, OR and heading over to uh, the recovery room. In the recovery room, you can see here it's hooked up and it's set to six uh, milliliters per hour. So typically what, what I've seen is you get reliable pain control through that, that's, that important a pain spike that every patient sees. You get very rare uh, quad weakness, so I think this is an improvement of a femoral nerve block. It helps minimize narcotics as evidenced in our study. And I just have the patients pull it out when they're done. It, uh, it sticks to the opsite, so when you pull the opsite off, the whole thing just comes right out. So here's what I was saying. So here's, uh, uh, this is spring of 2006 before I started sending patients home, so I was able to capture good uh, narcotic use data. Here's April. Uh, 407 doses, uh, May 39, June 50, July 26, 22. Significant improvement in narcotic doses. So what are the problems? Uh, well, in the first 500 cases, I had two patients, um, uh, three patients actually with a uh, adductor canal block related saphenous paresthesias. Two completely resolved, one only got better. She still has some numbness in the, in the shin. I'm not sure the reason. I, I, uh, when you talk to the New Albany group, they had a similar uh, experience. I do see about 6% uh, leak issues. So you will get a phone call, you're doing 100 cases, you're gonna get at least six patients that call saying there's some leaking. So you need to have a, a plan to address this. So if your anesthesiologist is going to do it, then uh, ideally they can answer those questions. I have my block nurse talk to those patients. The smaller ball doesn't seem to work. It runs out before you get over that 36 hour hump. Um, and again, early on, we saw one out of 50 cases that had a, this, this uh, femoral nerve weakness. It's typically, I have a lot of very short uh, uh, female patients in my town. Um, and, uh, you know, four foot eight, those patients have a little higher risk of this because I, uh, the block uh, seeps proximally and gets some of the quad. Uh, so you use a neomobilizer and it wears off by the next day. Uh, I don't know if some of it might be related to using the tourniquet with that, that initial 15 to 20 milliliter uh, bolus. I, so again, I'm not certain if it's my anesthesiologist got better or if I, I stopped using the tourniquet, did that make the problem go away? I'm not sure. Uh, the therapy details. So we're here talking about knees. So um, uh, for the, the knees, you ambulate once an hour, a short walk, bathroom and back, a kitchen and back. You're trying to prevent blood clot uh, and you're trying to prevent pneumonia. You're not trying to do strengthening to the knee. 
Uh, they do 10 knee passive extensions and 10 uh, knee heel slides, you know, getting the foot underneath the chair and then uh, locking your foot down, sliding your butt forward. That should get you uh, uh, some body weight behind that uh, flexion. And that's it. And they, they do it once an hour from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. They take a nap. They don't have to do it. If it's really painful for an hour, they don't have to do it. But they need to hit 90% of those boxes have to be filled. Patients like this. Your average uh, Medicare patient who's a Social Security recipient only gets $1,300 a month. It's $720 in co-pays for physical therapy for that patient. You don't have to figure out who's taking uh, gr uh, mom or grandma to uh, therapy. You know, that's three afternoons per week. That's nine days of missed work over six weeks. So, and your employers don't like that. I think one of the reasons we see less pain, less DVT is because there's less pain. When you go to a therapy session for uh, 90 minutes, that patient comes home in tears. They can't move. They're wrapping their entire leg in ice for the next 36 hours. They're not really walking. It finally gets better at 48 hours and they're going back to therapy again. That being said, you, I don't think you can just say, okay, you're not gonna do any therapy. I, I heard this talk and uh, all you need to do with these exercises, you really have to get them engaged or you're not going to have success. So uh, uh, we, we've seen it set multiple AUKUS posters that if you institute a maximum number of opioid pills, 40 or 50, Iowa's uh, study came out showing 40, I think we're gonna see a slide on that. Those patients still do fine. So I do think you should be backing off on that, that maximum number that we used to have to uh, send home, patients home with. I think everyone knows about using uh, some, multi, some sort of multimodal techniques. I know the AUKUS talks about Lyrica being uh, more effective than gabapentin, the pregabalin rather, uh, more effective than gabapentin. Uh, my problem with that is it's brand name. Brand name costs these patients money. Uh, I see success with the gabapentin. Uh, but the problem is there's no great study proving that yet. I think number three is the, probably the best, the most important thing. You need to uh, better educate your patients. And then who's at risk? Younger patients, total knee patients, more than total hip. Patients sent to rehab, and this one for sure, pre-op opioid users. So again, uh, a multimodal regimen decreases opioid use. Here's Rothman with yet another paper proving that, standard of care. Uh, I, if your state has what my state has, which is this uh, state narcotic monitoring service, I think this is very, very helpful. Um, you know, it really helps you identify ahead of time who's going to be a problem. And you talk to that patient. You talk to that patient before you even book their surgery. And you try to get them to de decrease the amount of opioids that they're using. And they know that you're on board because you've, and that you're aware of it because you're following their eye stop. So again, it's possible that my that patients are going somewhere else because they know that I'm a stickler about it. But I think the majority of your patients don't want opioids. They know there's a risk. And so again, use this. This is the one thing New York State has done positive uh, in the last uh, decade that I can really uh, be thankful for. It actually is a better uh, way to go. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. This is where Iowa instituted a 40 pill cutoff. They had no change in complication or call-ins. However, they weren't able to verify that the patients weren't going somewhere else. Uh, unlike in, in our study, we were able to verify that. So let's quickly talk about cost analysis. I gotta hurry up so we have some time for questions. Uh, I did the BPCIA during this period. My Medicare uh, inpatient TKA 90 day spend was $15,000 as compared to uh, when you looked at that the number uh, from New York Langone just published uh, 25,000. My target was 18,000. And these are my personal worst patients. All of my same day total needs didn't get included. So these are the only patients who stayed a minimum of one night and usually two nights to qualify uh, for that. Um, for that number. Uh, again, here's, here's my actual bundled uh, details. Uh, you can see uh, here's my number. So uh, you know, some patients and some surgeons want to know, uh, um, you spout these numbers, to Andrew, but uh, where's the proof? Here's the proof. So in conclusion, Get your patients engaged. This is the number one thing I think is going to make your practice better. This is a, an amazing difference in my practice. And then get your, all of your staff members in, in, engaged. So you know, get your core players in the OR, in the recovery room, uh, on the floor to be in, involved. Get them to read the book and understand the steps. Consider this alternative therapy protocol. Consider elimination of the tourniquet, uh, you know, 19% reduction in DVT risk. Uh, this currently is the best way I know of to get patients out the, out the door comfortably, happy to go home, 
Uh, and again, asking me at six weeks for a, a, a pain ball that lasts for six weeks, that's a very positive endorsement in my mind. And uh, I'm happy to have someone come out and, and uh, work with me in the OR. Um, I'm always looking for someone to uh, critique my program to see what I can do better. And I want to thank you for your time. Perfect. Just again, as a reminder, if you did have any questions, feel free to go ahead and type those into the pod there on the right hand side. We'll go ahead and pause just a moment while some of those questions come in. Um, again, just feel free to type those in on the right hand side and we'll take your questions as they are entered. So Dr. Wickline, any concerns with using um, the on cue intraarticular instead of having it anesthesia placed? Yes, I, I would not do that. I did that. Uh, my colleague in town, a uh, competitor, was doing it that way, and he was seeing significant pain relief compared to my patients. I was worried about infection, so I waited and I waited. And, and again, my, my hospital said, you know, uh, look at his, his data. His data is much better for pain relief. You know, you need to do this. It's a you know, silver impregnated catheter. I had no infections in the previous 1,500 total knees, uh, and I had four infections uh, in the year that I started doing intraarticular. So, Personally, I do not recommend that. I recommend it in the adductor canal. Great. So let's revisit your, your protocol as far as your, um, your on cue. Your anesthesia placed. Yes. What size on cue um, pump are you using? It's the 400 milliliter, but you overfill it to 550 milliliters. Okay. So if you have a patient that is using quite a bit on day three or four, do you... Go, think about going up to the larger size ball or sending them home on with another ball, another um, on cue pump after that, or you know, what you, is your thoughts on that? We do that. You know, there's, you know, there's always a value in, in, you know, you have to look at cost, right? So, you know, the, it's not an inexpensive uh, adjunct. Um, you know, if it was $25, sure, come back in, we'll hook you up with another pain ball. The problem is, is that, the negative of the pain ball, number one, is that patients can't really shower easily. You know, some of my nurses, some of my therapists that know can figure out how to a work around to kind of cover it up so it doesn't get soaked. Um, so that's a negative, I think, is the, the shower, uh, number one. Number two, um, it's really that 36 to 48 hour window. You know, the further it goes out, the, the little more leaking that you start seeing, and then, you know, the patients are complaining, they see a little bit of blood underneath the op site. I think, I think at that point, you, you've gotten 90% of, of what you're looking for, uh, and it's probably time to move on. Uh, I do use the cryoablation now uh, to get patients that uh, additional uh, relief, uh, and I do that preoperatively. So when patients ask for that six-week pain ball, um, I use the cryoablation for that longer acting, but it, I don't find it strong enough in that first uh, three to five days. Great, and we, when we set the titration, you're setting it to six, correct? Right, you can set it wherever you want. Uh, mm -hmm. I used, uh, because we've already got a bolus there. Um, uh, I set it, I just, that's the number it seemed to work best. We, we initially started it at four, and there were some patients who had increased pain, but th there's a percentage of patients that when, they, when that spinal wears off, they need that, that toradol dose and maybe one dose of narcotic in the, in the post-recovery area that can kind of get them over the hump. Or with general, when they wake up and they're suddenly awake, and they're feeling that full onset of discomfort, you know, they need one or two doses to kind of catch them up. And again, toradol seems to work, or ketorolac seems to work best for me and uh, um, really, really helps them. The six was the number that seemed to work when we first initiated the protocol. So I have not gone back to four. Uh, if patients are comfortable on the floor prior to discharge, I'll tell them to back it all the way down to four so it lasts longer. If you leave it at four, you'll get five days. And you do allow them to titrate it themselves, correct? That's cool. Fantastic. So let me ask you this. When you, with your protocol and having basically, you know, the working with the physical therapist beforehand to understand what they need to do at home. How did you kind of get that buy-in from physical therapy? Because, you know, for so many years it was, oh, we have to do therapy, have to do therapy, have to do therapy. How, how did you kind of get that buy-in from, from physical therapy to, to go with your protocol? 
Well, I mean, I'm not using therapy postoperatively, so there really wasn't a choice. Uh, what I did is I brought all of the local area therapists into my office and said, this is what I'm doing. It may not work, but I, I believe it works. And the reason that I believe it works is because I, I have two sets of patients. I have patients from the north of Utica that are up in the Adirondacks that have no access to therapy. And I have patients right here in Utica, in New Hartford, in the, the uh, you know, that's the pricey part of town. And they all went to, phys they all went to inpatient rehab. I had doubled the manipulation rate with the New Hartford patients uh, who went to re inpatient rehab, supposedly for the most aggressive therapy, right? Twice a day therapy. Uh, then the patients who went up north who said, Dr. Wickline, there's way too many exercises on the sheet. Dumb it down to four or five and I'll make sure it happens by the time I get back to the office. And that's kind of how I stumbled upon this, uh, this idea that, that uh, some simple exercises uh, and no strengthening Again, no one's doing jumping jacks or lunges on an ankle fracture in the first six weeks. That is true. So when you, you mentioned a minute ago that you were doing cryo on your patients. Are you doing that preoperatively or postoperatively? Preoperatively. It has to be done a minimum of 10 days prior to a surgery for a Medicare uh, patient. Uh, and uh, it allows that tissue, you know, that tissue, it's a, it's a thermal injury. So it's, it's helpful to have that tissue be happy. So I, I shoot for three to four weeks at a time. That was not used in the study, uh, just to make it clear. Uh, I'm hopeful to get down to five pills or less, or perhaps uh, a larger percentage of opioid free, uh, using the cryoablation in conjunction with the on -cue catheter. I look at the on -cue catheter as a sprinter. It's amazing for, you know, 100 yards, 200 yards, maybe 400 yards. But after that, uh, in running at full, full tilt, it, it's done. Uh, whereas the, the cryoablation technique is more like a marathon runner. Not that great out of, the, out of the shoot. And certainly in that first lap or two, not very fast. But it's lap after lap after lap. And so that's where you get the, the wonderful overlap of the two different techniques. And are you performing that yourself? I have my uh, physician assistants uh, do it using the anatomic uh, landmark technique so that it's reproducible uh, for any, you know, anyone can learn it within uh, one uh, uh, treatment cycle. You can learn how to do it. It's, it's very simple that way. If you do it with the ultrasound, I then I think you need, you know, either a pain management specialist in your town or an anesthesiologist that really wants to own that program. Uh, and, and that may be a more effective technique. I know the company is looking at doing a large uh, registry to determine which, which is more cost effective, which works better. Perfect. So question, um, the, you're using 0.5% Repivacaine. Why, why, why 5% not, not versus a, like a 2%? Um, I'm hopeful that that's the correct number. I hate to say it, but <laughs> it is the 0.2%. I looked at that. I could have swore it was 0.2, but, uh, or 2.5, but, um, you know, I hate to say it. I have to look at the study protocol again. My anesthesiologist does all of that, so I, I uh, it's probably not fair of me as the presenter to know that. I'm not 100% certain, but I, I need to look at the study now. Now, I, I can't quite recall. Not a problem. Let's move, um, move up a little bit towards your hips. A couple of questions regarding your hips. Are you, are you using any kind of blocks in your hips? Uh, I am, I'm using a periarticular block using the same exact contact, uh, uh, um, cocktail that was used in this study. Uh, I just published on that this month in the same journal. So the average number of opioid pills for the hips is 3.5 pills. Are you seeing uh, any increase in orthostatic hypertension? With the, on, the, on the floor for hips? I, I see the same for both. It seems like one out of three patients, the first time they get up, they get lightheaded. I don't know if it's, again, anxiety or uh, post-anesthesia uh, effects, but I just warn every patient that the first time you're going to get up, you got a one in three chance of feeling lightheaded that you might even pass out. And then over the next 48 hours, you're going, to see, you're going to see that. So I have every patient sit up, count to 10, stand up, count to 10, and then ambulate. Uh, waiting for that, that feeling, that, that rush of blood to the face, that, that, uh, that light sheen of sweat across the forehead to go away before they go on to that next step. Gotcha. So you're doing your total knees, you're doing your knees under a spinal? 
I do a mixture of spinal and general anesthesia. I know okay. the study is suggesting that the, the, the spinal may be better. Uh, I would tell you that the, my data showed, which was not in the study, that there was more re reliable and more rapid discharge with general anesthesia with spinal. The spinal uh, is very inconsistent in terms of recovery of muscle function. Uh, and then uh, additionally, the issue with urinary retention for the male patients. Right, what about hips? Mixture same, also? Same thing. Uh, again, the, it, it's, it's still the spinal that, that uh, leads us to a sometimes longer uh, motor blockade than we want. And so we again saw a minimum of two hours longer with spinal versus uh, uh, general on average. Great. I'm kind of moving a little bit away, a little outside of the box, and this will be our last question for you. Any good tips for minimizing blood loss during a t uh, total hip? Hmm. With an anterior hip, you know, you definitely want to cauterize those uh, um, ascending vessels as you come down through the uh, uh, TFL. Um, uh, and then um, there's going to be some posterior capsular bleeders that you want to look for once you remove the neck. Um, those are really the two areas where you'll get the bleeding. Uh, our, our average blood loss is about 350 cc's. Great. I don't use the Aquamantis or things like that. I, I didn't find it super helpful. Other guys seem to like it, but the price point and the value that I saw, I didn't really see a value. Very good. Well, Dr. Wickline, thank you so much for your time this evening, and we, we appreciate uh, being able to learn a little bit more about your t uh, total knee arthroplasties in 10 pills or less over 90 days. I appreciate uh, everyone uh, being uh, online for this. I, it's sorry it seems so boring when I'm just reading and just going slide by slide. I hope it wasn't terrible for everyone. I uh, hope you got something out of it. Please feel free to reach out and come visit, uh, or if you're doing something better than I am, please let me know because I want to come visit you. So thanks again for Avanos for putting this on. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. On behalf of Avanos Cute Pain, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Uh, please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help Avanos plan future web events. This does conclude today's program. Thank you and have a great day.